Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are in the world. I'm Gerard Medioni. I'm uh, the co-chair with Kevin Boyer of this conference, which is off to a great start. And uh, we're privileged today to have a, an outstanding speaker, uh, Lee Manor Zelnik. And I'm even more privileged to introduce Lee uh, to this audience. So Lee is a professor at the Technion and uh, on leave from the Technion right now at uh, Alibaba Damo Academy. I had to look up what Damo was, to, was standing for, uh, which is Discovery, Adventure, Momentum, and Outlook. Um, and this looks like a fantastic program. Uh, so Lee he holds a PhD in computer science from the Weizmann Institute. And uh, she also was a postdoc at uh, Caltech in Los Angeles. She's a well-known expert in computer vision. She has been a member of this community for many years. She was a program chair as uh, CVPR 2016. She's an associate editor at PAMI. Uh, she served as area chair as many of the conferences, CVPR, ECCV. Uh, and she's going to be the general chair of the upcoming CVPR 21 and the ECCV 22. So uh, we are very happy to have uh, Lihi with us today. And I'm going to pass the microphone to her. Lihi, welcome to WAGVI. And we look forward to your uh, presentation. I want to remind the audience that at the end of the talk, there will be a Q&A session, and you are encouraged to join and feel free to ask all the questions to uh, Lihi. With all this, Lihi, it's all yours. Thank you so much for this uh, very wonderful introduction. So um, I'm very excited to be here, although really I want to be in Hawaii. Um, so Israel is wonderful, but Hawaii is, is yeah would be more fun. So next year. So let me tell you a little bit about my, my story. So Gerard presented it nicely. Um, I chose to talk about towards making AI a commodity, closing the gap between research and practice. Uh, not everything I will present is my work. Not everything I will present is published work, but it will all tell this, uh, this story. And the story starts with my, uh, with my story, that most of my time, most of my career was spent in academia doing research at amazing research universities across geographical locations. Uh, I started at the Wiseman Institute in Israel and then spent some time in Caltech in the sunny California. And then after so many years in the sun, I had to spend also a few years in New York in Cornell Tech. But most of my, my career was uh, in the Technion where I'm a professor in electrical engineering and, and Technion Israel is really my home. Uh, what's much mutual to all those places is the wonderful research and uh, wonderful research people and the work they're doing there continuously. But I've always been also fascinated by the real world and the problems it presents to us. So therefore, two years ago, I decided to embark on a new journey and I took leave from Alibaba, from the Technion, and I joined Alibaba Group to lead the establishment of its R&D center in Israel. And this adventure has introduced me to a new culture that I was not familiar with before and a new world of, of industry that I was not familiar with before. So I shared with you part of my journey to, to connect with this, um, with what we're doing, what I'm going to talk about. But um, I think maybe this, uh, you, you will, know, knowing my background will explain why I chose this topic that how to connect research and real product. Because for me, this was uh, something that I had to learn over the past two years. And specifically in WACV, which is about applications of computer vision, I feel that many of those learnings are, are important. So I want to reflect on the gap I see between research and practice and give some examples on how we close this gap in Alibaba, Israel. I'm sure there are other people that have uh, other perspectives. Uh, but before we, we start, so Gerard asked about Damo Academy, but let me start about Alibaba because I think maybe many of you are not fam familiar with this uh, huge company. So Alibaba is actually an ecosystem. Um, it, it, it's a huge, it's a huge company. I think maybe a hundred and a few thousand people. I'm not sure. 
And uh, if you look at my slide that describes the Alibaba uh, digital economy, then you will see that it it has it is all based the, the infrastructure is based on Alibaba Cloud, which is the largest cloud the, the third largest cloud in the world according to Gartner, uh, and the biggest in China by far. And on top of Alibaba Cloud lies everything else. So the payment platform and by uh, Alipay by End Financial and Alimama, the marketing services, and then China, which is the logistics, because we know Alibaba has a lot of business in retail. As you see here, many different platforms for retail within China, international, with, in other countries, etc. cetera. Uh, but this is, retail is not the, the whole story. There are other verticals. So wholesale commerce, uh, consumer services like Fleegy is the travel, uh, travel arrangement uh, solution, and then also complementary, complementary uh, ver verticals that enrich your life and and connect with this whole economy like Yuku, which is the the video platform, and DingTalk, which is where we all communicate and and work and and do our video chats and and. Uh, and work our daily work life. So it's a whole economy. Uh, the Damo Academy is an organization that has been established in 2017. And yeah, the acronym Damo, I, I find it less important. I, what I love is the vision. Um, the vision is to do research for profit and fun. And Damo has labs around the world. So mostly in China, Hangzhou and Beijing but also in Singapore, uh, Seattle, Sunnyvale, New York, and Israel in this map at the center, which I very much like. And so DAMO is a global organization of, with research centers, but we do applied research and also core research, trying to really impact the world through, so, through real products. And just to give you just two idea, two examples of things coming out of Damo, not from my team, but from other teams. Uh, so here is an example of this uh, robot for last mile delivery that has been announced by Alibaba Cloud, Cloud in September. And this autonomous robot can last over 100 kilometers and deliver over 500 parcels per day. And another example is this analysis of COVID based on an X-ray, which was launched, launched very quickly last year and could diagnose COVID-19 in 20 seconds with 96% accuracy and was deployed in many hospitals when the crisis was at its peak uh, at the, a year ago. So these are just two examples and you can find more information on Alizila. Um, what I will focus on today is that, as I said before, talk about the, the gap between research and practice and how do I see it? So, so a real application has real users and this creates real AI challenges. And we cannot assume that some of those challenges have been, have been resolved. We have to address all the constraints. We have to be just to be able, not just to, to enjoy our research. We actually want to make it useful. So the vision for Damo is to do research for profit and fun, but profit is not um, I don't see it as a bad word. Actually, I see it as a sign that what we are doing is working and creates value for people and it creates value for customers. And in Alibaba, we strongly believe that customer first approach. So therefore we have to reach high user satisfaction in everything we do. To make things concrete, I chose to center my talk around one of the coolest products out there cloud drive apps. Now, maybe at first sight, you might not think that drive apps are cool. Uh, drive apps you might be familiar with. Uh, when I say drive apps, I mean, if you're in the West, maybe you're using Baidu Wangpan or Tencent Weiyun. Um, if you're, sorry, in the East, maybe if you're in the West, you'll be using Google Drive or Apple iCloud or Dropbox or Box. There are, there are many, many others, uh, many other, many solutions out there. And why do I think this is the coolest one? Um, because it is an example of a product that is used by millions of people. There are many, many things based on AI that people consider cool, 
like autonomous driving. It's definitely cool. I love it. But what I set my what, what interests me the most is to impact the lives of many people, to touch their life, to create this, to bring them value. And drive apps are becoming are making AI a commodity. They're making AI accessible to almost everyone. And I think this is I think this is the coolest thing that we can do this research and immediately deploy it and everybody has it on their mobile phone. I find it um, exciting. So drive ups. Um, so I talk about the product and why it's, why I think it's cool. Uh, but we're all computer vision people. So why is it also cool for, for for us? So let me describe a little bit what I mean by drive ups, and then we'll talk about we'll talk computer vision. So if you have a drive app, you can store and organize. So store and organize your your personal data. Um, but if we, if we go into the photos area, so. You can, for example, get the photos or beautifully displayed to you with uh, sorted by date and, and the nice ones uh, enlarged and smaller ones are uh, uh, less, less nice images are smaller. And this beautiful display lets you enjoy your images just more easily. Um, and then maybe the, the, the most useful feature is that you could easily search for images. So, for example, if my son wants me to get a photo of his third birthday party, I can just click birthday party and find all those images. And on top of that, I can have all my images. You see here a screenshot of all my images. These are my images actually grouped into albums automatically uh, with my swimming photos, my flower photos all are automatically grouped for me and they make my photos useful for me. So finally, I can I can really use them. And even to empower me a little bit more, uh, a drive app can create things for me. So for example, it can automatically create those stickers for me and help my social life by sharing those photos, uh, th those stickers with, with my friends. Now, I, I hope that you can see the connection to computer vision. Um, th there, there are lots, lots of challenges here, uh, plenty of tasks that we need to, to solve. So I just kind of, I put a partial list here at the top. But just to give you an example, if you want to generate this nice display, then we need to be able to find the most beautiful photos in order to highlight them. And we need to be able to, to compute or estimate the quality of an image, detect the silent objects, crop it accordingly. Uh, we also want to find images that are similar to remove redundant images. So already those multiple computer vision tasks just to create this simple looking display and then if you want to effortlessly find your images then you need to be able to do object detection and scene recognition and multi-label classification etc and even to create those stickers there we need so many algorithms like pose estimation face matting image stylization and and more so so much computer vision tasks you need to solve and this is why i think again it's totally cool product so today i will talk about some of this i highlighted multi-label classification image search and image in painting um, the rest i will not talk about today so cloud apps i think that uh, beyond being great for, for users they're also very interesting uh, and very relevant from the business perspective um, not just from the research perspective and the reason is that the personal digital co content is growing people have more and more data but with the infrastructure of the fast internet and file sharing and uh, manipulation becoming intelligence, it's becoming a more feasible solution. And uh, I think this drive apps are actually just the first, the first get, the first um, establishment of a personal cloud. So you store all your data on the cloud, you have your personal cloud, and hopefully the next step will be something more broad like this uh, Wu Ying that has been announced by Alibaba uh, also in, in September, which is this small device you see here, which connects you to your personal cloud that will enable not just storage, but also computing. So I think we'll see more interesting stuff in terms of your, your personal cloud. Uh, okay, so what is the gap between AI and research and practice? Um, this is my perspective. So first, I think multiple objectives. We cannot, we have to, our, our models 
cannot make any assumptions. We need to provide high accuracy. We need the models to be fast and easy to train. We need to low memory. We need fast inference. We need it to be user friendly and even more. We have to satisfy all the objectives. Uh, another aspect is that we have to deal with real world data. We cannot assume a nice, well built data set. The data is real and we have to deal with it. And then there's also the reproducibility uh, aspect. Today, I will talk only about the multiple objectives and dealing with real world data. I highlighted in red the points I, I plan to touch upon. Now, to deal with all of that, again, you, you need to start with building the right team. <laughs> so I know you want to hear maybe about the algorithms, but the first step is that you can't just do it by have by by, cert, by one type of people. You need to build a team that mixes researchers, practitioner, algorithm engineers, data engineers, software engineers, product experts that understand AI well. You have to put the whole gamut there. You need to have all those types of expertise. So th those people that love elegant optimization problems, uh, pragmatic algorithm experts that love making things work by finding the methods that consistently lead to better outcomes. And then you also need those wizard software engineers that can make your models run fast on any device. May it be TPU, CPU, NPU, on cloud or on mobile, you need it to run. Uh, now, in your research, you need to identify those topics, approaches and methods that tackle the real world scenarios and objectives. So let's see some examples soon. I will start by talking about the data problem and one aspect of it, um, the fact that data is often imbalanced. And I will talk about the, the data problem through the computer vision challenge of multi-label classification. So what is multi-label classification? Um, our goal here is to assign multiple labels to a single image. So for example, um, for example, if you want to look at this image, then we have here uh, uh, we have here uh, people, and we have a cake, and we have uh, wine glasses, and bananas, and oranges, and um, a hat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we want to find all those tags, or tags or labels. Probably I will use those terms intermittently. And typically we have a list of tags, and this list is big. So maybe there, there could be 10,000 of tags or 20,000 of tags that we want to be able to recognize. Now, one thing to notice is that in a single particular image, only a small fraction of those tags appear. So for example, here I kind of marked uh, how many, like six tags, but th there are more, but definitely not thousands. And this means that our data is by, by construction going to be imbalanced. So in any in every image we have just a small fraction of the tags, which means that inherently every when we do the training, we, the, the class imbalance is huge. So the number of negative labels is going to be much, much larger than the number of positive labels. And when you think about drive apps, often those rare labels are the ones the users search for the most. And therefore, these are the most important. So for example, while one, one might have very few photos of birthday cakes, it could be a category that is very important to users and they search for it often. So we need to succeed also on those less frequent tags. And, and finally, actually, there are studies that show that uh, there are relatively many labeling errors in multi-label classification, and probably this is because the manual labeling task is hard for human annotators. So, for example, here, intentionally, I marked cat as one of the classes. Well, there's no cat in the image. And, and this means that we should not fully trust the labels. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, research. So how can we solve that? So when we started to try and, and, and solve it, we just took the baseline, what do people do? We took a good backbone, tried to train it, used the cross entropy loss, which is the common way to train for multi-level classification. And uh, this is the loss. It, it uh, The loss is uh, actually the same for positive 
samples and negative samples and evaluates the confidence in the computed probability of the sampled image. Uh, now, what I show you in this graph is along the iterations of the training, what the probability looks like. So we want this probability to converge to one, both for negative and for positive. Uh, I'm showing you actually for the negative samples, one minus the probability. So we really want it to converge to one. And what you're seeing that for the negative samples in orange, it converges to one, but for the positive one, it doesn't. And the, this, the probability doesn't converge. So what do we do? So we thought there's, okay, this is because of the class imbalance. Um, we try to train with the focal loss, which is uh, the common solution for class imbalance in image detection. Oddly enough, we, we didn't find papers that use focal loss for, for, uh, multi -class, for, for multi class labeling, for, but maybe there are such papers, we just, uh, we haven't uh, encountered them. But anyway, what does the focal loss do? It, it gives, it takes this, the loss and gives like different attenuation to the positive and negative samples. And by that, it tries to put focus on the negative, on, on the, on the few positive samples. And if you put focus on the positive samples, maybe you can increase their impact and be able to converge. But in practice, it didn't work and it still didn't converge. So we had no other choice but to find our own solution. And to find a solution, we actually look, what we've done is looked at the gradients of the loss. Here I show you in this graph, the gradient of the loss of the negative samples. So what we want to do with, uh, what happens with cross entropy? You see it's it's linear, which means that we have a continu continuous gradient, which is good. It continuous means we can, we can optimize. Uh, when you switch to focal loss in orange, you see that we have nonlinear attenuation, which is a good feature, right? We want to, give higher impact to the high probability features, for the samples, so the high probability samples, sorry. Um, but this is, not, this is not enough. And there are three things that are missing. So first, because there's high imbalance, we want actually to threshold and set to zero the easy samples. Those that have very low probability, we actually want to kill them completely, not give them any, any weight. The other thing we want to do is that as I, I shared before, pro those samples, those images that get very high probability, they, they, they uh, harm the training. And actually, we think they're often just mislabels. So we want to kill them here. So instead of giving it high probability, we want actually to go to zero here. So essentially, the graph we want to get is something like this green curve that has nonlinear attenuation. It's continuous, but it threshold the easy samples and thresholds the over high uh, ne probability negative samples. This is what we want. And the, the, the most important thing also give high, high um, focus on the positive samples. And we found a way to do this, to give the positive samples uh, a focus and remove these the negatives by changing the loss, a, a simple modification to the loss rather than uh, we give just a different weight parameter to the positive and negative samples. And we also shift the probability of the negative samples and we cut off those probabilities that are too low, those samples that have too low probability. And this simple change resulted in a, in a world of difference. So now you see during the training, negative samples and positive samples converge. So this is great, and, and it also translates to real results. So you look, uh, I'll show you here some the, the MAP scores on Pascal, uh, MS Coco, and Nuswai, then you see that our results in red are better than the state of the art, which is different, by the way, for each data set. So we chose the best work for each data set and compared to the best one, and, and we outperform. And also on open images, um, on open images, we compare to the, our loss function to the focal loss, then we couldn't find a good a good um, result to compare to. Maybe there are such results, but uh, and you see that we get a, a very nice improvement in the map over using by changing the loss function. So this is the type of thing we look for. How can we actually make things work through simple ways? And the beauty of it is that it also works in practice. So now users can search for their photos and enjoy them. And you see here example of the beautiful photos of flowers that uh, I found. And um, this solution is actually working in practice, which is, which is cool. 
And this, as you saw, real world scenarios are complex since the data is challenging. And I believe that to overcome those challenges with the data and help promote science, one of the things that the industries should do is make such data sets accessible to the research community. So to not to stand behind my words, we've started to go in that direction. So we already released one realistic benchmark uh, called Ali Products. So this is through a workshop that was in CVPR 2020, and we'll have another one in the coming CVPR. And we released a large scale product recognition data set with over 50,000 different products and 3 million images. And this workshop is a joint venture with, in 2020 was a joint venture with Trax that also released a, a nice data set of product uh, detection in densely packed scenes with uh, over 11,000 densely packed shelf images. And in 2021, we're also working together with Facebook and we hope, hope to broaden the scope of the workshop into further domains. So I think this is one of our duties and responsibility to share this data and make it public and allow re enable research, uh, promote science for everyone. So this was the data aspect. Um, now let's talk about multiple objectives. So, and here, the, th this is the other challenge to go from research to practice. The fact that we have to address all those points and how do we obtain product, product ready models that that are efficient and so the buzzword is going to be efficiency and we tried several different ways to tackle this um, i'll talk about just a few today so one thing that we've done is how can we find architectures that are efficient and have high accuracy how can we do this when we have all those different tasks so the first thing we tried was neural architect research and um in your architecture search, you're actually trying to automatically find the architecture that gives you the best accuracy. And many methods have been proposed. I show here in the timeline just a few. But the first works required really, really extensive runtime. And you'll see that our focus is on efficiency. So we were looking for methods that run in a few hours because we cannot spend days on, on, on finding the best architecture. We had to go down to a few hours and we succeeded to do that. Um, our approach was based on, on, on DART, which is uh, um, one approach to architecture search, which is based on what's called micro-architecture search. So you define the macro structure ahead of time. For example, here you see, you decide that you have two cells, um, normal cells and reduction cells, and you only train, you only learn those cells. And how do you train the cell? So here's an example of a cell. This image is from the darts paper. So the cell has the input layer, uh, two feature maps and the output maps, and these edges mark the operations. And blue, green, red means that we have maybe three different types of operations that we could choose from. And the goal is to do, uh, to run an algorithm and optimize in order to select the operation for each of those edge, for each of those uh, edges. Um, so this was uh, by darts, and we were able to improve this by giving, making sure that we get a fair competition between the operations and gradually wiping out edges to get to this, uh, to this decision of which operation we should, pos we should position at each edge. Uh, our process, our algorithm was based on exponentiated gradient steps based on expert advice. And the outcomes is that uh, if you look at this uh, at this graph, then you see this is the number of search days on the x-axis. Uh, the y-axis is the error. Here we're training on CIFAR 10 uh, to find the architecture. And the color bar is the number of parameters. So what do we want? We want to be in this leftmost corner, which means we have very fast search for the architecture, low error, and we want it to be blue, which means compact network. And we are very happy. This is, by the way, from this paper appeared in uh, New Europe's 2019. So this is from then. Maybe I, I would assume now there are better methods uh, out there. So maybe the graph is not fully uh, updated. So we were very happy with this 
but then we realized that that's not enough. Uh, that's not enough because um, we maybe we need we have other constraints. So, for example, if you want to deploy your model on a specific mobile phone, we have to constrain the resources, and we can't just use an architecture that is good and compact, but not necessarily exactly within those research resource constraints that the phone provides. So we tried other approaches. And one of the approaches that we adopted into our arsenal of, of tools is network pruning. So network pruning can be done in different ways. One of the common approaches is to take an unpruned pre-trained model, as you see here, prune a fraction of the model, fine tune it, and then you ask yourself, is, is the model compact enough? If yes, you're done. So you started from this big network, you're done, you have a pruned model and you're happy. If it's not compact enough, you iterate. Luckily for us, we actually most of the time don't need those iterations. And how do we do that? So the reason we could do it without many iterations is that because we were able to formulate this problem explicitly. So what does that mean? So this is, this is the objective we want to optimize. So we have a network that is going to be pruned and we want to make sure that the accuracy on some validation set X is maximized. And we want to make sure that our network is within this, some predefined space of pruned networks. But we, want, we have a constraint. We have a constraint on the computation. It can't just be pruning to maintain the accuracy. We want to comply to some max, maximum uh, compute budget that is given to us, for example, on the flops. So we can one thing that we show in this paper is that you can take this objective and formulate it mathematically. Um, I won't go into equations here. It's just here on the slide. Essentially, what we do is if this is the network, we have those edges that we want to keep or or not keep. So if you want to keep them, the indicator bi will be one. If you want to throw them away, the indicator bi will be zero. So we have an indicator that counts which edges are kept, which edges are rejected. And for each edge, we compute the flops and the change to the loss function, which essentially tells us how the accuracy is going to be impacted. And we can write very nice equation that maximizes the um, maximizes the accuracy or minimizes the reduction in accuracy under the constraint of the flops and B is this binary indicator. Now, this mathematical formula is actually an AppSec problem and it can be solved with dynamic programming. So the cool thing about this is that we can really, di we didn't really need to do any iterations uh, most of the times, just one suffice. And you could actually apply this both to sequential and non-sequential architectures, which is, which is cool. So to show you some, oh, oh sorry. And, and then another trick is that we had to use is to use some in, uh, knowledge distillation. So if we have our teacher net, uh, sorry, teacher network that has its uh, filters and feature maps during the fine tuning stage of the, pr we take the pruned network, which has fewer feature maps and small, uh, fewer filters and smaller feature maps. And we apply linear production and make sure that the, there is a loss that tries to make those feature maps of the pruned network similar to the feature maps of the original teacher network. So this is uh, the equation here. So you take the, the pruned net, the feature of the pruned networks need to be similar to those of the original one. And we do this through linear, uh, linear projection. And this is called internal knowledge distillation, which is, we found it to be very useful. So now just to show you some results, um, what you see here on the left is a graph showing in the x-axis the flops, which we thought is a good measure of, uh, of uh, resource allocation. The y-axis is the accuracy, and this is on ImageNet. And we took several ResNets, like ResNet 101, ResNet 50, and ResNet 18. So for example, the red curve, we start from ResNet 101 and we start pruning. And as we prune, we lose accuracy but we significantly decrease the number of flops. So you can see that we can significantly reduce the network size and, and lose only a little bit in accuracy. So we're very happy about these this results. Um, you can all, 
also see here on the right that we could try to do this, apply this pruning to uh, non-sequential architectures like efficient nets. So we can take efficient net B0 and prune it and get an architecture that has better accuracy than mobile, mobile net V3, um, same number of flops, but our speed, uh, image per second, is much faster than mobile net. So these type of networks are now being used by us because they're, they really work in practice. So this was one exploration. Um, I think I told you I'm going to talk about efficiency from multiple different aspects. So when you know that you're going to work on a specific platform, that's cool. You can use architecture search and you can use pruning, but sometimes you need to deploy a solution on many different platforms. So for example, if you have working on a drive, developing a drive app, it's going to be deployed on many different mobile phones with varying quality, both high end and low end. So those methods for architecture, architecture search were, were not enough because we need something that really can solve many different tasks quickly for many different devices. So the scale is big. And here we just, I want to show you, we're not shy of learning from others. So how do we design an architecture for any platform? Here we really drew inspiration from uh, the work Once for All from Tsai et al. that was pub appeared in ICNR 2020. We really got inspiration from them. So thank you guys. Um, so what's the idea? Let's have, say you have your task is tech classification. Uh, you have a specific target platform in, in mind, like maybe high-end devices, and you have a specific target latency you're willing to suffer. Anything beyond that is not good customer experience. So um, you build a lookup table for the high-end device for the computation. And the idea of uh, once for all is that they train in advance a super network from which they can very easily search for sub networks that comply with these constraints of what is the and maintaining the accuracy and the latency. So very fast search within the super network to get the sub-networks you're looking for for this specific device. Now this, we found that, so, so this was the, the idea in Once for All. It didn't work well enough for deployment. So once we got this architecture, we've done some more fine tuning. So we have our own target data set that we need to so that we are successful on this real data set that we're working on. Train, but the super network is usually trained on ImageNet, for example. So now you need to have your own target data set and you need to do some transfer learning, knowledge distillation, the same tools I talked about before to really fine tune your, an, an architecture that you can actually deploy. So this is why I told sometimes if you really want to, to close the gap between research and practice, you need to borrow ideas from, other, from others and do good engineering. And another example of strong design as the other extreme. Um, sometimes we don't want to a solution that is good for any architecture, but rather is an amazing solution for a specific architecture, for example, for GPU. So actually here at Wakavi, I think tomorrow at four, we're presenting a paper on how to design an architecture that works very well on GPUs. And um, I think this, uh, um, my observation on this is that it takes many different tools combined to get such a strong model. And you need a very good engineer that can, can have a deep understanding of the training of deep networks and can do both the network design and an excellent implementation. And of course, you also need to have the computing resources to be able to run all those experiments. But you see that to design this network that we call T ResNet, we had to use both architecture design ideas and implementation ideas. And you can go to the paper to see what they all put is, what they all mean, but it's it's a mix of ideas um, that you put one and one and one, and each one gives you an extra benefit. And you can see here, we do careful ablation study. So we take ResNet and we compute the top one accuracy, the inference speed, the training speed, and <clears throat> sorry, the maximum base side. And we try, What happens if we change the, the filters? What happens if we um, do in-place uh, operations? What happens if to optimize the squeeze and excite? And every addition you see gives us plus 0.1, plus 0.3 accuracy. And 
eventually, all together, we get an architecture uh, that if you compare to ResNet 50, uh, has similar image speed, uh, image per second uh, training speed, a bit lower, they're 805 versus 730, uh, but inference speed is higher, accuracy is higher, and these are the things we care about the most. We want to make sure that we have high inference speed and high accuracy because we're going to deploy this product and we care more about this type of efficiency. So, and you can see by the way that an interesting observation here is that over the years, people have proposed various uh, adaptations and improvements to ResNet. And most of them have, um, are, are good on the flops. So for example, efficient net B1 has very few flops, but still, if you look at the inference speed, it could be actually um, not as high as the one we get with T ResNet, even though the number of flops for T ResNet is higher. And there is a, there is a secret thing here that the flops on GP, the flops are not exactly the best predictor of inference speed on GPUs. So these are uh, good in, good observations that have led to those results. Um, and again, to, 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 to make sure and convince ourselves that what we're doing makes sense, we tested on multiple data sets to see that we are uh, ranked ranked at the, at the top. And we always go to papers with code. We like to see how we stand on, on multiple different data sets. And uh, also like this, um, I like this tool, the SOTA bench, where that shows images per second versus top one accuracy, and and our models are here uh, on the on the right corner. So this is our focus: efficiency, and still maintain high accuracy. So there are networks that are that have high accuracy, but in this regime of the very high images per second, we're doing pretty well. Uh, okay, so when I talked about the gap between uh, practice and research, I said I presented the, these aspects uh, and I talked a little bit about imbalanced data. I talked about high accuracy and fast inference. Let's talk about user friendly for the last few minutes of this uh, of this presentation. So what does user friendly mean? We need to uh, make sure that we understand the user intent and we want often our solutions to be interactive. We want to be able to get feedback from the user, uh, do things automatically, and don't forget, simplicity is critical. The user interaction must be simple, easy, and fun. So let's see an example of how we do that. Um, I'll, I'll show two, two quick examples. One of them is this, uh, the stickers. So I, I tell you in a Drive app, we can create fun things for our users. So even those funny stickers, the silly ones that you might say, oh, like, why is this interesting? Well, for computer vision researchers, they're totally awesome. They require solving so many problems. So given, given a, a photo that on my drive, I first need to um, filter the pro portraits in the photos, and then I need to match to extract the portraits. I also need to match them to some template stickers that I have align the pose, make sure they make sense. And only then I can create the, the stickers. So I need to find the network. So many tasks here that I need to solve, which is totally fun for a computer vision geek. And uh, finally, imagine benchmarking this. Think of the researcher that works hard to improve this solution. How can they evaluate the quality of the sticker creation? So this is yet another challenge of real world scenarios. How do you benchmark? Uh, but I will not talk about how we benchmark this uh, today. Uh, another example is image in painting, which I worked on in the past, but now making it work in practice in the real world and deploy it as a product, I have to make sure it's uh, user friendly. So what does it mean that the user maybe wants to just click on this girl and delete her? Or the user might want to scribble over the image to delete this uh, backpack. And I don't show in this video, but maybe the user might want to kind of rerun things to fix the artifacts. So to do that, to be able to delete this person, um, I have to do great object segmentation, right? If I want to delete this person with a single click, 
I need to segment her from the background automatically. I need to have a solution to be able to handle the scribbles. I need to have a solution for in painting in the wild. I can't assume rectangular areas. I have to be able to in paint whatever region the user marked, complete or with holes or not. And it has to be fast for real-time experience. The user really cannot wait two minutes to get a result. Uh, and this video shows you um, what it looks like in practice. Actually, we have this display, uh, deployed on, on Aliyun, or which is Alibaba Cloud. So you could uh, try it over there. Um, so just to summarize it, we have to solve all those cool computer vision problems to create a good and fun user experience. And then I talked a little bit about benchmarking for the stickers. I didn't go into it, but here you see that one of the things that are different between research and practice is that when we go to evaluate a problem like this, like in painting, then we can do the standard, uh, We not, not, not just we can do, we, we actually, we do the standard way of evaluating on some benchmarks, right? We want those quantitative measures. So for example, here, uh, we show results of our in-painting methods on GIF2K data set comparing to one of the one of the recent state-of-the-art methods. Uh, there are others, but just here for brevity, we chose that one. And we make sure our numbers are, are better. But we also need to remember that um, our goal was to create something that works in practice and is fast and is friendly. So we compare ourselves also to other competing products, other apps out in the market. So just take a phone and try it out. And uh, you can see here um, the qualitative comparison that we're happy that we're doing better than what we could find um, in other products. So those things always have to come together. The quantitative on a nicely built data set, but also the qualitative way of evaluating the user experience. Okay, so um, two minutes left. So let me wrap up. So I tried to talk about the gap between research and practice. Um, I talked today about, about solving things for real users. So making things fun and friendly. Uh, I talked about efficiency and complying with multiple objectives. So we had to find architectures that are efficient, fast to train, low accuracy. We have to put this whole gamut in there. And I showed various methods. I don't have a solution for everything, but various ways we tackle this um, in various scenarios, multiple devices, single devices. Uh, we need to solve all of those uh, cases. And then also I talked a little bit about real world data. So what happens when your data is imbalanced and non-perfect? And there are many other problems here that one needs to solve, but I did not talk about those today. What is the message I tried to, to send here? So first of all, I want to convince you that cloud drive apps are awesome and that we should work on products that create real value for users uh, and create real world challenges for us to solve as computer vision uh, people. So I think this should be something we should all consider. How do we bring AI to everyone? And I think in terms of the if we, again, because we're talking about research and practice, the industry has a part to play here. Uh, it, for, it can, for example, contribute um, and enjoy, it can contribute and enjoy the AI research together by selecting research topics, but also by providing maybe data sets and benchmarks that help researchers promote uh, work and explore those uh, exciting directions that have real world objectives and real world applications. So I think uh, I think the industry should be doing more in publishing multi-objective needs and providing uh, those benchmarks to enable this type of research and to see more of it. So this uh, concludes my talk. I think uh, I'm right on time. So thank you for, for listening. And um, I think at this point, I, um, I can take questions. Hi, thank you, Lee. It was a, a great talk. You covered quite a lot of material over there. So let me let me start the the question by question for me, is that you know in the process of building this product, um, 
Can you talk a little more about what is a push and what is a pull? How much is technology driven and how much is given by the, the product definition and then you try to apply the technology to it? So it's, it's a beautiful question. So I, my approach, um, I love uh, multi-scale optimization. I don't know if you're familiar with those numerical, um, numerical methods from Achim Brandt and the people of the like. It's always business and product driven. We start from that point, but it has to be kind of a, uh, an iterative process that goes, starts from this uh, top, the business, and goes down to the technical aspects. And if we cannot solve it, okay, the product can decide whatever they want. If you can't solve it, it doesn't work. So, and then we can also do the other way around, bottom up and say, look, we have those capabilities. Let's make use of them. So um, the design process is we start from the design, from the business to the design to the product, and then we decide on the technology. But the, but once we decide what technologies we want to deploy, then we iterate together and it's a joint, effort to decide uh, how to provide the best user experience and and often we often we will not so, so we, we the objectives and the constraints will be indeed different so it might be more important um maybe I'll, I'll give you an example maybe it's more it's better for the user experience for example if you want to find all the images of flowers so what is more important for the users uh precision or recall the user might have different preferences depending on on the specific uh, scenario and we need to th consider that so sometimes we will develop a model that has um higher precision and sometimes the model has higher recall and this is decided actually by the product requirements thank you no that is it that is great so we got a number of questions that came from the audience so i'm gonna pass them to you the first one is from David Peer, uh, and it relates with your labeling and uh, with a proposed methodology that considers wrong sample labels. Can you also use your training model to detect wrong label samples to create, for example, a better data set? So, so indeed, one of the I think one of the secrets um, is how to get how to uh, clean your data and how to refine it. Uh, it's one of the trade secrets and using them all, actually often this is how we start because you know, we, we can't just use users data, right? It's private, we don't touch it. So what do you do? You take images and you start by running some model, you get the labels and then usually we have a human in the loop to help us clean those, um, clean the, the, the outcomes of the model and we feed them back in. So we have cleaner and cleaner labels and we do that. Uh, we also use other tools like um, we could use um, other models, for example, to get those labels, et cetera, and, and put this all together to clean the labels. But yes, this is a it's, it's good habit to improve your data. Good. A question from Siavash Kodadade. What information is in the gradient of loss that you cannot extract from the loss itself? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think just uh, the, the reason we looked at the gradient of the loss is, this is actually what we propagate, right? When we train, we propagate the gradient of the loss into the network. So it was when we try to understand what's going on, why doesn't the training converge? And we saw the loss is not converging. And then we looked at the gradients and then it became clear. Um, and when we looked at the equations, we look at the behavior of the gradients, then it just, for this particular problem, it made it clear. Actually, I can tell you that we try to look a little bit deeper into this and try to see, um, we try to look at uh, various loss functions and their gradients. And we saw some, some information there, but, uh, to date, we don't have any paper on this yet. Um, we couldn't make anything uh, very significant out of it, but it is interesting. So maybe you want also to take loss functions and look at their gradients and see what 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 it tells you. It 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 does tell you something about what you're actually updating while during your the training iterations. Thank you. Thank you. A question from 
Nikki Ruka Uzwek Bunam. He said, do you see other application for the multi-label asymptotic loss? So definitely, I think that um, actually, uh, so, so I think the this uh, asymmetric loss or the, the multi-label classification is a general problem. So if you want to do scene understanding, um, anything you, uh, if you want to do scene understandings, for example, even in, okay, I'm not, I'm not in the autonomous driving uh, uh, domain, but I would expect that, that you want to recognize all the objects in the scene. Or if you have a robot that wants to interact with people, you want to recognize all the items in the scene. So I, I'm pretty sure that it's needed in many different uh, scenarios, um, counting product in stores. I'm just starting kind of to, to brainstorm while I'm speaking um, to throw ideas. So I think, yes, I think this is uh, actually a very broad problem, a very a problem with a lot of use cases. And I'm not sure why it's not that popular in research. It gets much less attention. Um, I don't like to have to to state strong things. Usually, things are not uh, do not get much attention because they are maybe harder or the data set is too big. So, open images is one of the big data sets for for multi level classification, and, and it's huge. So, I think many research labs might find it difficult to work with open images. I think this could be one of the problems we're not seeing more research because it is a practical problem and and has many use cases. Uh, I I agree. I agree that this is a this is a core is core component, and then finding the applications is really, uh, yeah. you know, will be will we'll find them. Okay, a uh, question from Suvik Kundu. Very interesting question. You talked about the lower inference speed of the efficient net in spite of having much fewer flops. So is it because of the latency increase due to the depth-wise plus point-wise convolution or something else? Could you please give a little more explanation of this uh, surprising result? So if you don't, so I think this is mostly specifically for GPUs that we saw that the connection between flops and, uh, and uh, inference speed is not necessarily direct. And actually, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit rude and ask you to attend the talk uh, on T-ResNet tomorrow. Sorry for okay. doing that, uh, but I have, to, I have to give uh, room for um, yes. Talarubik who's going to present this work, and he's the expert that has done this, and I feel it's he should be answering this question. But, but yes, essentially, you're right. There are certain operations that actually are not well fit for GPUs, even though they have fewer flops, they're slower on GPU because of the, the way GPU is built. But uh, okay. so they'll have to wait. wait. They'll have to yeah. wait until tomorrow to get the yeah. real answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question for you. Uh, I think a very interesting question from Mohammed Anwar. Have you considered using natural language expression uh, for interface? For example, for the in painting. Uh, tell the user would say, remove the man from the picture. Uh, the answer is yes, I have considered. Um, and hopefully we'll see results at some point. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, oh, that, okay, we still have one minute. So how do you view the trade-off between collaboration and open research versus trade secrets and keeping research private to maintain competitive advantage in industry. Um, okay, so this is my view. So you might see my team has shared data. My team has shared uh, like T-ResNet, we shared it, it's, uh, it's on GitHub. We try to share code as much as we can. I'm not that afraid of uh, maintaining my competitive advantage. I feel that almost most, almost most of the time I have it anyways. I'm ahead of, um, I keep going, I keep going, I keep progressing. And if I contribute to the research community, then I get so many people working for me. I think it's just a cool way to get my problem solved and I can learn from others. I would be very, it would be very um, 
prudent of me to think that I can solve all the problems better than everybody else. So if I enable other people to explore the problems that I want to solve, it helps me. So I think this, um, yeah, we need to, to do that. Of course, sometimes there are things that really we cannot, like the company might not let me release, but whenever I can, th there's always those extra layers of actually putting something into the product, which is still in computer vision, very specific for every scenario. You've not, if you have a good model, you have not solved it. There's more. So you can release the model, you can release some, the data that is not private, of course, if you can, then go ahead, release it and let everybody progress. That, that's my belief. And that's what I've been doing. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, this is a wonderful opening session for WAGV21. Uh, I hope uh, the audience uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. And again, thank you for participating. And thank we look you. forward to seeing you soon at uh, your conference, your conference that you're organizing at CVPR 21 and uh, many other conferences. So again, thank you very much. And thank you, Zeran. It was fun to be here. All right. Bye, everybody.